safety management. In his current position as the process safety manager at Proman, Mr. Mahade was actively involved in the promotion of leadership and operational excellence for all the process safety obligations. Mr. Mahadeo is a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a BSc degree in analytical chemistry and biochemistry. He is also a graduate of the University of Greenwich via School of Business and Computer Science with an MSc degree in occupational safety and health. I'd like to welcome Mr. Mahadeo, who will give us a presentation today, as I said, on emergency response planning. I do have one request. If you all have questions, please type them in the chat and we will compile them and post them to Mr. Mahadeo at the end of this presentation. So, Mr. Mahadeo. Okay, so our topic, winning the emergency, principles of effective command and control. There are two things which are limited at the onset of an emergency. Think about any emergency you probably experience, or if not, you have read about or heard about. So in this particular example in our process plans, <clears throat> think about a scenario where there has been a rupture of a vessel containing a hazardous material. That is what the information is. You also have information, there's one casualty, and then you have some information on wind direction. Typically, this is the kind of information we'll receive at the onset of an emergency. Now this graph, this graph shows on your horizontal axis time, on the vertical axis information, all right? And where the, the, the axes intersect, pretend that is where the incident begins. So on the, the red line, you all are seeing this the graph, right? On the red line, as an event, emergency event progresses, more and more information is obtained. Conversely, as the emergency event progresses, our options decrease, as shown by the blue line. And hence, in emergency management, there's an optimal time to make decisions. Typically, that optimal time is where the uh, two lines intersect. Beyond that intersection, well, one can imagine, we will be obtaining more information of the event, but then our options are decreasing. And of course, I don't have to convince you, more and more damage is being done based on the emergency event. The other thing about the graph, it will show you the effects on people. At the beginning of the emergency, generally people will become overwhelmed. That is normal for an emergency event. As we get more information and we learn more about the emergency, you can see we have, as we gain what you call situational awareness, and we begin to put things into motion based on our training, based on our experiences. But then what the graph is showing, as time progresses for an emergency event, people have this way of losing their, their emotion and so on, of losing the battle because any emergency progressing for any length of time proportionately will result in more and more damage and possibly more and more people getting hurt. And that is why as emergency managers, 
people has to convene in an optimal time and with limited information sometimes we have to make decisions now here is a video clip to show typically what can happen in organizations on the onset of an emergency i hope the video works Are you all seeing the video? No. Okay. So I will escape this. Let me see how I'm escaping. So can you see the slide still? A new slide, stepping through the door? Yes. Okay, excellent. Stepping through the door. This is a concept where on the other side of the emergency door, the world is different. So what does that mean? Those charged with mounting an effective response must click a mental switch. Continuing to operate in the Business as usual will not work. All right, I don't have to convince you all of that in an emergency. What this is saying is, and I'll give an example. If we enter a room and there's a fire, whatever is available, a blanket, an extinguisher, a water hose, we will grab it to extinguish the fire. That is all we are focused on, extinguishing that fire. Think of any emergency event other than a fire. Once you are in the room, which is the concept, you are focused only on that particular event, managing that event, extinguishing it, halting it, etc. The concept here is stepping through the door, just stepping out the door. So when you're in the room, you are only concerned about extinguishing that um, fire. When you're out the door, you see the bigger picture. And a lot of times in managing emergencies, we are managing it as though we are we went, we came in, we are through the door and not out the door. So that'll be expanded as we go ahead with the presentation. This is an acronym here, what we call the meeting briefing format. So think of any emergency event you put had personally, whether it's a car accident, what's it, whether it's an um, emergency at home. This acronym, when you look at it and you understand it, it in sequence, it will tell oncoming relief, any emergency responding teams, exactly what has happened. So M, you declare any major incident. What is the incident? E, you are relaying the exact location. T is type of incident, and you can include the time of the incident as well. H, are there any hazards present or suspected? So imagine if fire services has responded to your um, business, and this is how you are relating the um, brief. A, the access, what are the routes available to access the um, very emergency vendors and what routes are unsafe. And the number, the type, the severity of the casualties, and if by chance you know the names of those um, injured persons, because you can imagine what you'll have to use the information for. And then of course E, emergency services present and those that are required. Any questions so far? Or probably we'll take it at the end. On the key guiding principles, so these are tools that emergency managers can use. The key guiding principles, of course, governs personal, public, 
environment, the plant, or your business, and security, also known as PPEPs. So in managing an emergency, think of these key guiding principles. A handrail for leaders, A, C, D, C, F, U. A, in terms of this acronym can be used by all groups, all emergency responding groups to guide effective command and control. Anticipation, similar to risk assessments, plausible what-if scenarios should be brainstormed to aid in preparedness. For example, what if by the rupture of the vessel, critical adjacent equipment was damaged? Do we have spare parts? What if the neighbors are affected? Communication. How do we know when proper and clear communication has been achieved? We ask for confirmation by the receiving party. Delegation allows for achievement of multiple activities at the same time and by the persons best suited to do the activity. What skill is maybe needed of the person delegated to the staging area coordinator, for example? Directional, communication, knowledge of the plant or the business, the layout, and knowledge of any possible hazards. Concurrent activity. Which single word comes to mind? Simultaneous, yes. This allows for a fast response. It is important that persons with roles in emergency response familiarize themselves with their responsibilities as per the emergency response plans. Flexibility. This speaks to being creative, improvising, and thinking outside the box, as you say. For example, if phone lines and radios are down, how else can we communicate with each other? Pertinent information to the various response sectors. Always remember, there is more than one way to get the job done. Urgency. It is important not to panic. Remember what they say about panic, right? That can be contagious. However, urgency speaks to prompt and immediate need for action. If prompt action is not taken, a worse scenario can unfold. And we do not want that. For example, if we, there's a loss of primary containment of a hazardous material, and we do not shut down the plant, as per shutdown procedures, then a major situation can develop and get worse and there could be more damage to the equipment and by extension, the neighboring facilities or environment. So the handrail for users, ACDC, FU, handrail for leaders. Main types of briefing. We have protocol briefs, focus briefs, and timeout briefs. Typically, for protocol briefs, you lay out the plan. The incident commander or the lead lays out the plan, informs those present about the incident. In other words, what we currently know about the event. And we close by asking any questions. Focus brief. This is a request for information in one minute. This briefing deals with primarily with facts, not conclusions or recommendations, but rather the facts, what we know. Use it to present high priority information requiring immediate attention. Inform everyone of the situation. 
assign actions to each person. So each sector has responsibilities. There's a frontline, there is a support group, of course, from the incident command system, there's the incident command team as well. And then there's a timeout brief, the expectation of the team, each person to share the information they have on the situation. That way, informed decisions can be made. One of the things in emergencies is a performance review. And the performance review has to do with command and control, for example, what went well. So during an emergency, when you um, have the, um, there's something called a hot debrief, which is following the emergency event when you have it under control. And then there's a cold brief, cold debrief that can occur a day or two afterwards. So what went well? And these are examples of what can be shared. The various response groups established and they were set up promptly. The various leads gave clear direction during the management of the event. There was continuous request for information and there was verification of the information. There was clear analysis and quick decision-making when information was gained. The leadership was always confident and calm during the emergency. The team gelled well during the emergency. And of course, there were excellent protocol briefs. So those are some of the comments you can make with command and control. And then there are some suggestions here, areas for improvement. For example, the incident commander attention should be on focuses and the assistant incident commander's attention could be on tasks. What you want the frontline to do. A lot of times frontline workers, those managing the tactical aspect of the response, they are our eyes and ears of the emergency. And sometimes they have their own priorities in the field. By, from the incident command system levels, 100, 200 systems, they have to really adhere to the focuses of the lead leaders, the incident commanders. So an area of improvement could also be something about, be cautious about pressuring the emergency response crews for details too early. Avoid chaos. Information updates morphed into group discussions. Briefings should not be informal. When someone has to give a briefing, the, the attention of the room must be ascertained and people have to listen to what new information or updates are given. And yes, sometimes there can be distinct times when the effort in the room started to fragment. You know this, people having small meetings throughout. Information management now. What went well during an emergency? At Proman and at TMAS, we use boards. So the information boards were kept up to date, more accurate based on information flow. There were regular situation briefs. So everyone in the room or in the various response sectors had situational awareness. And it was not a privilege for a few. Actions or tasks were quickly generated, monitored continuously and completed in an efficient time manner. For the focus, start with provide is a really good idea. For example, provide assistance, provide resources, provide advice. 
areas for improvement generally could be focuses should be defined by the commander and not by those who are writing up the board or the board marker. Continue to take the key decisions in the incident log because sometimes if something goes really bad and you have to audit the key decisions, those logs are uh, become legal uh, right documents. And therefore it is important when key decisions are made that it was logged. Clearer and prioritized focus points should be displayed on the board. For example, account for personnel on the site. That's like, that could be a clear focus. Shut down the plant could be a clear focus. Extinguish the fire, right? And those are clear focuses from in terms of the incident commander. That is what they want to happen. So by accounting for personnel, what that will translate into it, did we have a headcount? Is it matching the records for those who should be on the site? Are there any missing persons? Because if there are, it requires other actions to, to be generated. For example, you have a search and rescue now versus if all persons are accounted for, then the response crews can focus on the emergency and not spare many resources searching for someone. Taking a moment to prepare before delivering briefs. So when you have to give briefs, say time will brief in one minute. So people have sufficient time to, you know, collect their thoughts and know what they are going to say. And then we have improved utilization of the site plans and maps. Who is looking at these things to ensure that where we have resources, where we need additional resources, and are we always looking at the big picture? This is an example of a situation on the information board. The situation, what are our aims or focuses, and the tasks. So that anyone entering any of the response sector rooms at a glance could see on the situation side, what is the situation, what are our aims and focuses, and therefore, what are the tasks? And the tasks are really for those in the room, in that sector to do, right? And therefore, if it is to obtain information or headcount, they will have that responsible person in that room and who they will talk to, whether it's a support group coordinator or the emergency response captain. Decision-making. So for example, what went well? The leads stood back and made clear decisions. So this is an example of stepping through the door and out the door. Plans were revisited to ensure they were still applicable. In these um, plans, we do depend on people just to um, have memory of how to manage an event. We have incident action plans for a number of risk scenarios. So if we have fire pre-plans, et cetera. So if there's an incident involving those things, we pull our plans and therefore it's like a brainstorming exercise. We go through it to ensure it's a few pages only on what to do, not necessarily how to do it. So we put our fingers on these plans to ensure that they were applicable and that we were covering all the angles. Decision-making in response to changing situation, and it was incisive. And the example early on with wind direction, sometimes wind direction change. So triage area, staging areas may have to be relooked. And we continued evidence of anticipation and what if assessments. What else can go wrong given the incident and the information we have? Areas for improvement could be declaration of a level three. In your institutions, you will have 
different levels of emergencies and how are people um, notified, whether it's a siring, a beeping sound, public address announcements. What if the incident controller delays too much? When should the incident commander step in? These are considerations. Decisions should be translated into tasking to formal briefs. So when we have formal briefs, we use the opportunity there to task persons in the room to obtain other information or to get situational awareness on certain things. Resource management. Here we have the concept of going big. Go big very early. In other words, what we do and what we practice, get as much resources, fire tenders, company ambulances, as much as possible in our staging areas. Get responding crews from the various plants to report to the staging areas. If it is that we do not need those resources, that is okay. But we have this concept of go big early. A number of times you see from lessons learned around the world, they felt they could have managed the event with these resources they had at the time. And then it escalated. Resource tracking was handled well throughout the drill. Always have an appreciation and situational awareness of where our resources are. So when I, for example, an ambulance left the site with an injured, a casualty, understand that you have to track that ambulance to when it reached the hospital, if it's gonna stay there, if it's going to return to the staging area, and if it does return, when it returns, so that we are tracking the resources. The incident commander is regularly asking probing questions about resources and support to ensure that we have proper incident management. And good early work on recovery planning. There's always this anticipation. In our environment, we want to restart our plants. So we challenge teams in the support group. Start looking at damage assessments start looking at what we need to do to restore the plant to design conditions such that we can start up in the shortest time frame all right areas for improvement sometimes we look at there was ongoing effort to pull resource information from the support group sometimes information is not pushed up to the incident command team you have to be pulling asking people and so on Whereas they're supposed to be getting information pushed up. Recall earlier we said the crew captain and the response crews are the eyes and ears of an emergency typically. Sometimes if the event is prolonging, going, taking long, are we anticipating that teams could be getting tired? They could be shift handover, etc. How do we sustain for longer incidents and yet maintain capability? So these are tools that we were using all along to manage emergencies at Proman and by, by, by our TMAS companies. And once as emergency managers, we use these acronyms to help jog our memory. So it's right, it, it will help us realize this and we, mean, we do not have to have all the information for an event to be successful. Okay, so I'll stop sharing here. Okay, uh, Mr. Mahadu, first of all, thank you for that very informative presentation uh, on emergency response planning. We do have several questions on the uh, chat, which I'll, I'll go through. So first question was, what training and professional accreditation should an emergency manager have? 
Okay, so typically we follow the ICS model, insulin command systems, which is a universal uh, convention. And we follow the level 100 and 200 uh, syllabus. So as a starting point, to make sure we all aligned in terms of the, the language that is used in managing emergencies, that, that system is followed and is endorsed by the TMAS operating group. Okay. All right. Another question was dealing with stress during an emergency, example, time, pressure, information overload, etc. Please provide guidance based on your experience. So how will you manage uh, those things, those stressors? Okay. Now it's situational, but typically what we do at um, in TMAS and, in, and Proman, our company, for stress and so on, because we have multidisciplinary um, groups working right in collaboration with each other, we, um, let me see, based on the information, people have information at various locations. And if someone is experiencing stress, there's what we call timeout. Yes, so there's timeout, um, information overload. We look at the information in terms of what is priority information. So for example, if there's a major fire, you have to ask questions like, what is involved? Do we have any idea of the chemical? Because combustion products now is what is the, um, the hazard there. The chemical is burning, but the combustion products with wind can, um, so therefore, you'll find that we take the information in bits. Do we have the safety data sheet for the chemicals that is burning? Do we have the safety data sheet for that chemical to see how to manage it? Is it water we have to use or is it dry chemical powder? So we take the information in bits. Otherwise it would definitely will be overwhelming. And, we get, and, and in our organization, you will have the go-to persons, meaning you have to know the strengths of the people in the room at the time. And based on their knowledge and experience, they are, will be the go-to persons. Got you, got you. Um, another question, uh, as an emergency manager, what is appropriate body language when managing an emergency? Yeah, typically, I mean, it's easy to say, right? But you have to remain calm. Got you. You have to be that because again, panic is um, contagious. So anytime you start um, panicking, then that does not help. Nice. So, you know, typically in an emergency as the graph was showing, we have seconds. So you hear an event and it is normal for humans to go into a certain mode. Sometimes you freeze up and that is normal. But with proper training, that is what kicks in. So let's assume the first 100 seconds, you couldn't, you couldn't speak, you made no contribution. That is okay as well. But then your training has to kick in. And then you start now. And that is why at TMAS, we practice drills. They are drill exercises where the idea is to continually improve. And when you have those kind of exercises under your belt, as you see, then it, come, it kicks in. So that mm -hmm. even the unfamiliar becomes familiar because you practice that in drills. And each drill exercise is a different scenario that we exercise. Right. Um, another question, what technical type of emergency response training do you recommend for strategic emergency response incident command team versus tactical emergency response team? Okay. I mean, for the commanders and so on, again, we go with the ICS level 100, 200, I believe that up to is 400 and 500 as well. 
but that is what we are Mizzen American or a US system. Mm -hmm. And then we, again, we, we utilize that and we actually have drill exercises to okay. ensure that the, the learnings from those um, modules are practiced. Okay. Uh, uh, another question based on, on one of the questions earlier on stress is, you, you know, when people do get stressed, so how do you manage removing stressed personnel from the critical tasks? So you're in the situation, you're managing the emergency, realize somebody who's tasked with a critical task is obviously under stress. How do you manage that person you know, to remove them from that task? Typically, I, or in our model, we have alternates. So you find that if somebody is really stressed, one, you reduce the capacity, their capacity. So whatever is the workload that the person is currently managing, one is to reduce. And in reducing, you prioritize. And in prioritizing, one component at a time. If that doesn't work and you have resources which typically is scarce right but if you have resources and you could have an alternate or have someone support the person that is those are the options but really you, you don't want the person leave the room sometimes that you have to work with what you have and all you can do is slow down the pace slow it down as much as possible because anxiety sometimes leads to this stressor Sometimes it is a perceived um, stress. And it, it all has to do with the influx of information. But once you prioritize and approach one priority at a time, it goes a long way in managing the person. Because the person has a lot, the, the person, sometimes the expectation, they're thinking they have, there's a lot of expectation from them. And yes, but it's not all at once. I got you. I got you. You know, as we as you were talking about removing personnel, uh, you know, and keeping them in the room and having alternates, we have an excellent question here in terms of with work from home becoming a norm. Has there been any discussion on solutions in the use of virtual command centers? So an um, emergency happens at night where key members of the ICT are not on site. Any discussions on a virtual command center? Well, actually, at um, Proman, we have developed emergency response platforms, virtual platforms, where managers can be at home. And remember, the tactical team is the one in the field, right? Mm -hmm. They are dumping the copious amounts of water, etc. They are managing the ambulance and fire attendants and so on. And then there was a command team, albeit even in a real event, they are in a room remote from the event. So we have generated, created these virtual platforms. It's almost like a hybrid approach. So remotely managers with their experience can generate their focus areas. What are their priorities and communicate via that virtual platform to the tactical teams. We also have the ut utilization of smart glasses where the team in the field can wear these smart glasses and share videos, right? So there's a lot of technology and we practice those in our drill exercises. Okay. Uh, you know, all this use of technology brought up another question. How do we handle these uh, managing an emergency in the event of a power failure? I recall in February, well, at least in Trinidad, we had an island, um, total island power failure, and the plants were shutting down, right? At any point, at least as industrial estate. And that in itself is an emergency where we have transient operating conditions. And the command teams had to convene. And when we convened for, in, for the first initial four to six hours with the cell phones going on UPS on interrupted power supply, we had 
cell phone coverage, but we also had on the plants radios. So we were lucky in the sense that we had the option of using um, radios to communicate with our control rooms, our support group, and our command centers. Okay, okay. Uh, earlier you spoke about um, having your drills, um, you know, regular drills in terms of keeping people sharp. Uh, this is a two-part question. How often do you revise your emergency response drill plans? And then which stakeholders do you involve in this process? So quarterly, quarterly we have a drill exercises. For TMAS, it's uh, typically annually we have um, we, we have a drill, and then all the TMAS companies, what they do, they will invite the TMAS executive or TMAS members to, to be observers during their drill exercises. But so there's a, a frequency of drill drills that are occurring in the industrial estate, at least in Point Lisas. They keep people very sharp. But the second part the question was, um, who do we invite? And companies have their protocols in terms of inviting external persons, right? With the TMAS membership, we have um, kind of flattened that consideration where we know how confidential information can be. And therefore, when we do invite external company members, we know it is for the benefit of the group. And therefore, during those real exercises, nothing proprietary is, um, is really shared. It is really the structure of the drill, the objectives, the concept of the, the acronyms that were shared, how that was manifested during the exercise, um, concept of cool debrief and the hot debrief concept, and lessons learned. That was the most important thing. What lessons are we learning when we conduct drill exercises to share with the organizations? Okay. Uh, I have a question here in terms of, um, is it that you, you mentioned TMAS, which trans a bigger emergency mutual aid scheme. Is it that this organization is for member companies to join or is it that uh, individuals can become actively involved? Well, there's an annual membership fee and with that membership, there's a lot of um, literature and engagement with other companies, uh, with the common team being emergency response management. So in terms of that, I don't have to convince anyone, the potential resource and the access to personal in terms of networking. And okay. you find that companies with any potential for an emergency event, that is beyond their resources. Think about joining the organization and companies have fire tenders. They have ambulances. They have well-trained and certified emergency responders. So think of the potential bank of resources you can access being a member of the TMAS group, which is, um, a registered organization and is part of the, you know, is law. Part of yes. the Parliament Act of Shanti Tobago is a registered body. Okay. And we have, and we have quarterly membership meetings where there's a general meetings, right? Where we share lessons learned and we have presentations on building capacity. So for example, in this calendar year, TMAS is running in May and June, and then in the fourth quarter, the incident command system training for members. Okay. All right. All be at subsidized um, prices. Okay. Um, there is a question in terms of uh, sharing of information as would be part of any emergency response. 
So in the form of, um, in, in terms of information on fatalities, are there any guiding principles to follow when sharing this news uh, around fatalities involved in an emergency? I mean, companies will have their confidentiality um, state, um, you know, rules and so on. But once there's a fatality on a site, I mean, that'll be national news, right? So in terms of company will be hesitant to share, each will have confidentiality protocols and so on. But in terms of TMAS, we have, we, we have engaged a website developer, by the way, and we are developing our website. So in terms of resource information, being a member, you'll have access to that website. Okay. Okay. Um, there's another question here in terms of, is there any other zones or committees of uh, TMAS besides Point Lisas? Well, we have the um, chapters. We have various chapters throughout Trinidad. We even have a chapter in Tobago. All right, so we have the Southwestern um, chapter, Southeast chapter, Northwest, um, Central chapter, Tobago. And then we have, remember, we have the upstream companies. So like the beach field and so on, mm -hmm. all those companies. So I don't okay. know if I answered the question there. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, there is one, uh, there's another question here. Is, is there any formal training given to persons who are required to make a public statement? So that person in the emergency response team who has to brief members of the public in terms of training? No, I'm not aware of that. But for example, in Proman, we have our communications department with a communications manager. And based on our HR procedures and so on, we know that the average employee cannot speak to the media. That is all, all that is part of a confidentiality agreement that we read and have to sign to annually, albeit electronic, right? You're right. Yeah, but, um, but we have in our emergency response plan, we have those persons actually identified. So the, if I may answer it like this, in your emergency response plans as well, is to state those persons and their alternates or designated police people who should correspond with the media, etc. So we, we have that in detail. So that there's no mix up of who should be sharing information to the public. Okay. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Uh, I really do have to thank you again, Mr. Mahadeo, for this uh, informative session on emergency response planning. And um, I do, there was one more question in terms of how does one become a member of IOSH? So we, I did provide a link in the chat in terms of how you can join IOSH uh, and get more information. And do we do have a Caribbean branch, uh, which is on the microsite. So if you click around on the website, you can find information on past meetings and also upcoming meetings and you know, through our social media page. Um, so thanks again. And to everyone who attended, thank you for uh, uh, attending this session this afternoon. And I do wish everyone a safe and productive weekend. Thank you very much. Okay. You too. Keep safe. Okay. Bye, everyone.